So welcome ladies and gentlemen to today's webinar. If you haven't done so already, please take a moment to go to Tools, Audio, and Audio Setup Wizard just to make sure that you can use a microphone if you'd like to participate in today's session. We've had some people introduce themselves in the chat room. Um, it sounds as though people definitely want to travel the world. We saw London, we saw New Zealand, we've seen the coast of North America. So thank you for introducing yourselves. Before we get into the content of today's session, I'd like to take a moment to thank the funders who support Cochrane Canada and these webinars that we're doing now. The Canadian Institutes of Health Research provide funding for Cochrane entities across Canada to do the systematic reviews that we conduct, to disseminate them, and to provide training. So thank you very much to CIHR. I'd also like to thank PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization. They've kindly provided us with the software that we're using today. They give us the license to, to use this room. So I'd like to thank them very much for their support and for kindly preparing the webinars in a YouTube format, which means that people can download them after the sessions. Thank you so much to Luis Gabriel Cuervo. For today's session, you'll see a participant window where you see everybody's name listed. Underneath that, you'll be able to ask a question by raising your hand with the little hand, uh, hand sign in the green arrow, or you can indicate whether you agree with something that somebody said, whether you disagree, <laughs> or whether you'd like to send a round of applause. So can I get a happy face from everybody to indicate whether or not you're happy with the weather where you are today? Thank you so much. The last function that I'd like to introduce is this polling function. You'll see the red arrow here on the screen. We'll use a poll partway through today's session, and we'll ask you to use the green check mark to indicate yes, and the, the red cross to indicate no. You'll see when we get to that part. So for today's session, we only have one microphone activated at a time. This is to help the, uh, to help the webinar go more smoothly. If you'd like to use the microphone, please raise your hand, and one of, whichever moderator it is will indicate that it's your turn to speak please remember to turn off your audio by clicking on it again. So today's presenters, I'm Erin Euthing with the Canadian Cochrane Centre. I'm based in Ottawa, and I was formerly with the Campbell and Cochrane Equity Methods Group, on which some of the work today we're presenting is based. I'd like to turn it over to Mona to introduce herself. Um, thanks, Erin. I'm Mona Master. I'm a clinical lecturer in evidence-based dentistry in the Peninsula Dental School in Plymouth in UK, but I'm also the co-convener of the Agenda on Point Setting Methods Group, which is the second webinar from our Methods Group presented here. Thank you, Erin. Over to you again. Thanks, Mona. So today's presentation is on an equity lens for priority setting approaches and systematic reviews. Mona is going to introduce the, the group, talk about the work that we're doing, and get the webinar started. Mona. Thank you. Um, um, we are talking now today about the equity lens, which is developed by me, Erin Newfing, Vivian, and Peter Tocqueville. But I would like, before I go, before we go and uh, present the equity lens, I would like to thank a number of people who have helped us in the process of uh, building up the work for the methods group, which are all listed here. And there are a lot of more people who are getting our support. And um, we had a webinar last week about introducing the methods group. And we would too have two other webinars coming the next week about more implementation issues. But this week, the, methods, the um, um, webinar is focused on a methodological issue about what is price setting, how you can conduct it, and how can you, how can you incorporate um, equity in it. Um, it would start with a presentation from Erin explaining to you what's research price setting and what is the role of it in the Cochrane Collaboration and Research in general are. Erin? Thank you. In today's session, we'll look at what research questions are, how we ask questions that address priorities. We'll look at setting research agendas and what does that mean, and how do we answer those questions and agendas? What sort of answers can we provide and what tools can we use to provide those answers? 
we'll match the two up, making sure that our questions and our answers are linked, that we're answering the right things at the right time for the right people. And we'll talk about how priority setting plays a role in that in increasing the relevance of the answers we're providing. We'll look at some frameworks for priority setting, some specific tools and methods that you can use to conduct a priority setting exercise, for example, with your review group or with consumers. We'll finish up by looking specifically at equity. What is equity? What are we talking about when we say that? And how can you apply an equity-oriented perspective or an equity lens to priority setting. So we'll start off by looking at research questions. How can we recognize a potentially important research question that could have a high impact? How do we know whether that question is going to produce an answer that makes a difference, that is integrated into policy, that is used in practice? Maybe sometimes it's the questions that are biased, not the answers. Well, perhaps the research question is being driven by industry. Perhaps the research question only considers clinically relevant outcomes and doesn't address patient important outcomes. Sir Ian Chalmers said that uh, professional good intentions and plausible theories are insufficient for selecting policies and practices for protecting, promoting, and restoring health. Over to Mona. Thanks, Sir Ian. Um, the next slide, before I go forward, I do like to give some background about the collaboration and how it relates to the priority setting. Um, I was one of the people who later joined the collaboration, and when I was talking to people who were at the beginning in the establishment of the collaboration, one of the things that people highlighted was the structure of the collaboration, having volunteers, having clinicians being able to volunteer to do reviews and watch the methodologies in the review group, was part of the bigger structure to help the clinicians come up with the questions and try to answer it with the system. And the collaboration, being fair, has been very good in achieving answering some of the questions that other people didn't address them. However, we have seen looking at the bigger picture that we still could be do a better job and we could do, do, a, do better methodology to identify important questions to be answered uh, by Cochrane reviews. Therefore, we have established a Cochrane again and by setting methods group to look more carefully in it. Over to you, Erin. Thank you, Mona. So when Mona's talking about the, co the collaboration, what is she talking about? Well, she's talking about the Cochrane collaboration, which was established in 1993. Currently, the collaboration has over 28,000 people from over 100 countries who are working together to prepare, update, and promote the accessibility of Cochrane reviews, which are systematic reviews. The collaboration's aim is to help people make informed decisions about healthcare based on the best available research evidence. Thus far, there are over 4,600 Cochrane systematic reviews that have been published online in the Cochrane Library. So what are these systematic reviews? Well, systematic reviews bring together evidence from primary studies to produce an answer, to produce the best informed evidence-based answer that can help guide clinical practice and future research. That is, systematic reviews can help us identify gaps in different topics. We can look at systematic reviews and new overview of reviews which combine results from multiple reviews on one topic, such as preventing obesity. And we can also look at network meta-analysis. Next part of today is looking at how we can take the questions that we're asking and the agendas that we're setting and combine those with the appropriate answers and how we can set priorities for those. I'm going to turn it over to a over to Mona just for a second, and I'll ask Mona to give a quick explanation of, um, of how we can match questions and answers together. Mona. Thanks very much, Erin, for that. Um, so, um, before I go to asking everybody whether they can have them for our setting or not, uh, um, I'll just give you a little bit back on what 
providing answers to the questions. Um, when the Pandemic Collaboration was established, the first issue that was addressed was any other research question before going to new research. We have to first identify whether the current research has adequately addressed the questions or not. And so that's how the matter reviews have been done. And there could have been a guide about how new primary research needs to be done or not. And there is a famous statement by Ian Chalmers saying this matter of uh, every research should start and end with this matter review. So this matter review should have shown there is a gap in research, new research is done, and it's been covered in the review again to update the evidence about it. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not always happening with the sticky charcoal. But, uh, and it, it is not only that people don't want to, it's all uh, there is no current uh, consensus that an methodology to address that. Um, I would hand over to Erin to give you to do a survey how many of you have a form for setting your exercise or not. Thanks, Mona. So underneath the participant window, you'll see a green check mark and a red cross. I'd like to do a poll and ask everybody to take a moment to answer the question, have you done a formal priority setting exercise for research or health? So we'll give just a moment for everybody to answer that. Green shark check mark or red cross, have you done a formal priority setting exercise for research or health? And from what I see, there's quite a variety of people on, on the call today. I see that some people have. But there are a lot of people who haven't done a formal priority setting exercise. A couple of people have actually written in to give some examples of priority setting exercise that, exercises that they have done. Participant 41 says, I haven't personally done a priority setting exercise. But colleagues in the Cochrane Ear, Nose, and Throat group have participated in the James Lind Alliance PSP. Sally Crow writes in, the James Lind Alliance is completed, or has underway, 16 priority setting projects to date, all to do with interventional research. Janneke says, in the Netherlands, around 14 priority setting projects had been taking place. Tracy said that the, the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy in the UK has undertaken two priority setting exercises for physiotherapy research over the last 10 years. So thank you so much for sharing those examples with us. I really appreciate that. Thank you. So we all set priorities every day. For example, which email will we answer first? Um, but what does priority setting mean in a research context? What does it mean when we're looking at setting priorities for review topics or for updates? Well, research priority setting is part of the research cycle of identifying stakeholders, understanding context, identifying questions, prioritizing those questions, and actually conducting the research, disseminating your results, and then looking at implementation and whether or not your findings are being taken up in practice, evaluation, and provision of opportunities to appeal the findings, that is, of your priority setting process. So I'm going to turn it over to Mona just for a second. Mona. Um, thanks, Erin. Um, um, I will be talking about, Erin has given you an overview about how to start setting in a bigger research cycle. And, but in order to be able to define it more better, we have to come up with some categorization how research by setting can be categorized. One very general way to categorize it is to categorize the quantitative technical approaches, which you use data like the burden of disease, economic data, and other types of data. Uh, to make your decision, and interpretive assessments, which use subjective ways of involving uh, qualitative ways to involving different stakeholders and their views in the current settings. And of course, there can be also maximum method approach. This is not the only categorization for safe site setting. Some people look at um, categorize it in futuristic approaches, being like horizon scanning, but you try to predict what would be the new research that could change, uh, change everything, and retrospective um, part setting, which is you, you, you find it based on existing data. However, I think the quantitative and qualitative approach is the best way to categorize it for our current work in the part setting methods group. Okay, so Erin um, told you that it's 
The research plans have been sitting in research so I can. And we talked about the system reviews should be the start and end of a, any product setting. Right? So how would it look like? It would look like this. So you have a research question and you would do a system review. Make on the review, you make a decision. You see that the um, evidence is adequate to make a decision or you need further research. And then if you make a further need further research, you do primary research and then inside do you need to update the review or not. There are three red arrows given, which are the places where we can do research by setting. The first one is we have a research question as you see how important is this question that it needs to have this much review compared to all, all other questions. And the second arrow on the right side of you is when you adopt the decision, you made a, you have the review, you made a decision. The question is, is there still a gap in the evidence that you need more research? Do you need more research on this topic or not compared to all other topics that are there? It's the second decision making one. And now primary research is done as in literature. The question is, does the primary research would change the evidence or not? Do we need to put effort to update the review? And uh, compared to all of the reviews that we need updating, which acting is more important. So we have three places we can decide setting. I have to add that um, research doesn't always happen so clearly in cycle, but gives you an overview of how this ideal person might happen. Um, the next step is now we want to see how we talk a lot of part setting, we talk about cotton collaboration, and how they fit together. So I give you the that the whole idea about that when people clinician could approach a centralized method group, it is it provides an opportunity to this volunteer approach that the collaboration has, that people come with their questions find it, try to find the answers themselves by doing this model reviews. We wanted to see in the collaboration how do people do public setting, how are the different approaches. And we asked all of the CRGs and the Cochrane parties and the networks on field. Um, and from 66 of them in 2008, 52 answered to us, and 29 of them had some kind of process to inform them. But all of the processes had room for improvement. They used two um, ex frameworks to evaluate them, which I would explain later, and we saw a lot of places that they could have an approach to improve them. And uh, one of the things, we, we can take the surveys and we took it to the Cochrane Colloquiums and organized workshop meetings. And it came up that there is a lack of clear knowledge about, lack of clear idea of what we need to do, what is the best method to do prior study, what are the best approaches. There's a lot of unanswered questions. And then we did the search for the literature, we saw we not that it is not, it is all the national literature. So we took the first step that we always do in a collaboration is to do a so cotton review on part setting, which is the review scares on doing. However, because the gap of the evidence is very big and there are lots of impartial questions can be asked for part setting, we decided to establish a method script. And one of the things that cons consistently came up from our discussion with different people in the collaboration, also the collaboration, is there is a lack of clarity of in including equity in parts setting, which is the reason why we developed this, uh, this um, equity then. And so I want, now I want to talk about different frameworks for parts setting, because one of the first steps that we took is how can we know that the product setting is good? How can we conduct a good research product setting exercise? There is a framework published in 2010 by people in WHO, and it talks, it, it guides you about when you want to prepare and conduct one, what are the factors that you would consider? It gives more general categories of different factors that you need to consider along the way rather than a framework to evaluate it. So it was a very helpful framework. It was published after our research. We didn't actually use it there. But when we also later looked at it, it couldn't actually help us because we wanted to we wanted it is a good framework for somebody who wants to conduct it, but when we did the survey, it couldn't help us to evaluate the results of the survey. So going on the next slide. Um, 
One of the other things we did, I come later to the frameworks again, we also did something, we, call, um, we did a review of reviews. So before we collect our system master review, we wanted to see whether anybody else has done a review on private setting or not. Again, following the four principles of the avoiding the application of effort. So when we did the search of the literature, we find six uh, methodological reviews and two topic specific reviews on product setting. They weren't all systematic reviews. We collected every review who had some kind of critical approach about it. And there were some general themes that comes up from all of the reviews, which I listed here, which is about consistency and efficiency and transparency in, con in con conducting product setting. And um, it comes repeatedly from the literature that having an accountable and fair and transparent part is important. It's also, it was in many part settings unclear how people set up criteria for establishing part setting and this needs to be reported transparently. And the other issue that was raised was some, some people use certain data to inform the part setting. And the level of uncertainty in this um, data is not always reported and makes it difficult to make judgment how how valid the price setting results are. So going to the next slide. All this looking at all of the spectrum resulted that, we, um, that there was no other smart review which really compared different methodological aspects and looked at the impact on research also and decided to do our review. The review is still ongoing because we are very um, we are faced with a number of challenges. Like, um, what is what is kind of appraisal tools should be used? What outcomes should be measured? And we are still in discussion. What's the best way to do that? We came up with some solutions, but they are not. Um, maybe they, they, there is no room for discussion about it. Um, I do like to get, present you also a framework in health rights setting. It's a framework how successful health rights setting can be. And then we uh, conducted a survey in 2008, and we were evaluating the results of the survey of the Cochrane Group in 2010, uh, 2009, and 10, beginning 10. The, uh, this uh, framework was published and we used it. And uh, later, we also, when the WHO good practice on public. We still we want to compare whether it was better to shift to the other framework or not. But we still had the feeling this framework is more helpful than the other one. So this framework is about a conceptual framework for successful health rights setting. And um, it does have two sections. It has a process element and an outcome element. And the process element, there are different factors that we consider it includes stakeholder engagement. Uh, that all of the important stakeholders are involved. Transparent process, information management, there is a systematic approach about how the information to inform part setting should be managed. Context and value. Whether the each special local situation and the values in the people is considered or not. Revisions and appeal mechanism. This is one of the this is one of the biggest criticism to most of the research price setting exercises that they usually do the process, have a result, but there is no um, mechanism to revise appeal or um, what was raised in the previous webinar to update this price setting process. There is also a few outcome elements in the framework. So the outcomes from elements um, come relate to when you do the process, you have the outcome, what happens afterwards. It considers whether the results improve stakeholder understanding, so that it actually engages the stakeholders and the stakeholders feel that they increase understanding. If you look at the different factors, it all talks about if people are involved, if the right stakeholders are involved, if there is a transparent process, but if people have a better understanding on the results, do they accept it easier? Are there positive externalities? Does policy, legislation, does um, media um, um, be affected by the results of it? Does the decision making policy change? Does the, alloc the allocation of resources change? For example, if you turn left research price setting exercise, does the funders 
um, take over your part setting and decide to um, decide to uh, fundraise in that film. So when we did the survey of research part setting, one of the other steps that we took was to try to um, define what are the main steps that we could have a good part setting exercise, which were just, um, the squares that you see in the middle. So um, you define the objective, you involve stakeholders, you define criteria, you select the methods and tools to identify random topics, you do a situational analysis, which is your information management, you do a consensus, you come with the list, you eliminate it, you implement it, you get the feedback up here. And it, it goes in the round. So then, I, then we uh, map this set and see in which set how the each fact element from the process element from civil framework fit in. So it's how it relies to civil framework. So um, before I go, so this is just for some basics that we did when we were doing our research for our method skills and trying to develop the curriculum. Now, um, in this stage, I will hand over again to Erin, explain a little bit about equity to you, and then I'll come back to you and I'll show you how this background about the evidence about the measures of fast setting and this background about equity that Erin explains to you relate to each other and uh, result in the development of the equity lens. Over to you, Erin. Thanks, Mona. So when we talk about equity, what are we talking about? What, what does equity mean? Well, health inequity has a moral and ethical dimension. Inequity refers to differences which are unnecessary and avoidable, but which, in addition, are also considered unfair and unjust. So what this really means is that we're looking at differences in health outcomes. So for example, differences in mortality or differences in uh, disease incidence. We then need to consider whether those differences are unavoidable or avoidable. So something that would be unavoidable would be, for example, a genetic disease, at this point at least. Things that are avoidable, we then need to consider whether we consider those differences acceptable or unacceptable and unfair. So for example, differences in obesity prevalence and on soci lower socioeconomic status. This is what we're considering when we're talking about equity issues. But why equity? Why does this matter? Well, equity in health matters. It matters in life and death ways. Moreover, achieving health equity within a generation is achievable. It's the right thing to do, and now is the right time to do it. Why do we need an equity lens when we're talking about priority setting? Why, why does equity matter? Well, an equity lens can help us guide the process of prioritization of systematic reviews of healthcare interventions. Specifically, an equity lens can increase the proportion of prioritized research questions, which reduce the health equity gaps. For example, the differences between rich and poor. An equity lens also helps us to evaluate interventions that can be potentially effective in disadvantaged groups. That is, across different uh, socio-demographic groups, such as. And I'd like to ask everybody on the call what we're talking about. What does that mean? Who might be considered disadvantaged? When we say disadvantaged or vulnerable, what sort of groups are we talking about? What sort of populations? So we'll give a moment for some of those responses to come in. We'll just, I can see a few people typing in, so we'll just give them a second for those responses. Shi Jing has said, aged groups, absolutely, people at different ages, at, for example, older people or infants. Natalie says, new immigrants, new immigrants and refugees. Mm -hmm. Cam says, lower socioeconomic status, people of lower income. Claire and Doug also said, low income. Emma notes specifically those with no health insurance. Mary says those in developing nations with higher prevalence conditions such as malaria, etc. Thanks, Mary. Pam's written those at risk of poor quality of life and shorter lifespan. Absolutely. Some religious groups, depending on what, what culture you're from or what, where you're living. People with inherited diseases, Aboriginal groups. Linda says First Nations. 
disabled, poor mental health, tracing notes geographic location, and we have sexual preference as well. Eileen summed it up really nicely. She said, anyone where the social determinants of health are compromised. And that really gets at what we're talking about here. So thank you so much for all of those responses, everybody. I, I really appreciate your contributions. Um, the Campbell and Cochrane Equity Methods Group has taken all of these different components that we're considering here, and we use a mnemonic called PROGRESS PLUS. The first part, PROGRESS, is an acronym developed by Tim Evans and Hilary Brown, who looked at place of residence, um, rural, urban, north, south, low and middle income countries, and so forth. We can also consider race and ethnicity. Occupation, do you have a job? What sort of job do you have? Let's look at gender and sex. We consider religion, we heard that one. Education level, not just attainment, but also literacy. Socioeconomic status, or SES. And looking at social capital, that latter one being a little hard to operationalize in a systematic review, but really trying to capture concepts such as uh, marital status or community involvement. The plus part of Progress Plus it was developed by Josephine Kavanaugh et al, who are considering additional factors such as age, sexual orientation, disability, and policy environment. That last one, policy environment, um, would refer to something such as if you were born in a community where uh, tobacco smoking was banned in restaurants, or if your mom was working in a workplace that actively promoted uh, breastfeeding at work. Those sorts of policy environments may or may not put you at a disadvantage for poorer health. So I'd like to turn it over to Mona, who's going to look at how some of, these, uh, some of these equity components that we've been discussing can be applied to a framework for priority setting. Mona. Um, thanks very much, Erin. So now we finally come to the equity lens. So I want to talk to you um, for the questions for the equity lens. Um, however, I do like to point out that we don't know expect that every party setting needs to answer all of this question as yes, well, or address all of this question. The, uh, the equity lens is supposed to be a guide to inform people what are the different aspects, what are the factors that they might want to consider and might be relevant to their topic so that they would miss it. So the, and what one of the things we did, um, you remember the slides with the squares of all of the steps and the CBOL framework. So we, uh, mapped all of the questions across the CBOL framework questions, and we have two, two sections, the process element section and the outcome element section. So in the process one, the first question, a very obvious one is, are all the important stakeholders engaged or not? And, um, and we are using to, to highlight who are the disadvantaged groups that you might, who are the different stakeholders that um, to involve, we would encourage people to think um, a different dimension of progress plus. And sometimes amazing when you begin to think about it, some of the factors that you didn't start before becomes important. Like when I talk with people in diabetes, people who live in, in Christians or in, West, or, or in Western countries um, may not always have, uh, have not always contacted people living in Islamic countries who, who um, people who are Muslim have to take a max fast for one month, um, the whole month. And if you are diabetic, it very much affects your life and you have to get special arrangement with your physician to do that. So the research question is very specific to this group, might not apply to the to the others or it doesn't come up. And if you don't consider this, Difference when these people involved, you never get the questions or never get this uncertainty about it. Then the next question, and um, the next question is very obvious, but does this position at all consider it as an objective or not? And um, which fits into the issue of transparent processes. The next question is a more general question Does it say the methods and tools that we use to catch the opinion of these people affect? about who you can reach and who you cannot reach. Like, if you use online surveys, you, you use a lot of people who are not 
interested in technology. And if there are a big target group of uh, relevant to your topic, you would have a problem. So if you have a disease who is usually people happening over in older people who are less likely to use internet and you use an online survey to find out of the questions, you have a problem. Another very obvious issue is about literacy and language. So if you want to do international survey and do it in English, you obviously don't catch up people who are non English. These are very general methods of a survey, but it, um, it all makes people think about other, other approaches to um, reach people and find questions about it and prioritize the questions. The next question relates, um, trying to be more specific, it's not only what is your method in to reach the people, have you taken first certain strategies to reduce barriers like translation? Um, the next question. Uh, the next question relates to information management. As we mentioned in the review of reviews, there are certain data people use to inform the part study. And if the question is, does the data reflect the, the health inequalities or not across different disadvantage groups? And are whether or people are aware of this inequality that an innate position will try to set it? Sorry. Um, the next question is, I'm very sorry, it shouldn't happen there. Um, the next three questions is about the criteria for prioritization. And um, we, we look at it in three, in three days. One is that, does the criteria, criteria for answering, I should probably explain first what it is. The criteria for our setting is, when you are in the price setting group, you want to find those questions. People either tell you, do it based on your opinion, what's important to you, or they may give you some criteria to do it, like uh, what, which of them has the biggest health impact, which of them is more effective, and so on. So when you select your criteria that you give to people, the stakeholders, or you use a quantitative approach to find science, does this criteria incorporate the difference in the severity of energy of household friends in disadvantaged groups or not? There's some problems might in a high income society not be a big issue, but be a very big issue in a lower society. A very simple example is um, if you're in a if you're in a secure job, if you don't you lose a few days out of work, you know, sick leave, it wouldn't be a problem. But the same issue with somebody who has an insecure job is a big problem. So the urgency of the health problem is different. The other impact is, does it incorporate the potential difference in impact of the health and care intervention? And um, it, a good example I've seen in one of the cotton reviews was um, about um, staying home and staying stay in the hospital. And there was a group of authors from South Asia who were discussing that this is a very important culture important outcome for the people in the area. It's important that they don't stay in the hospital and they will be home. So the homeless people value the difference in the impact of health intervention is different. And finally, is there different values and preferences? And a very common example that I give is in countries where abortion is considered very badly, when you have some high, high risk or religiously not acceptable, when you have a high risk of a genetic disease like carcinia, who you want to prevent, you need to the base preventive to diagnosis through pregnancy and abortion, which is not acceptable religiously. Um, in some countries, like Iran, they take other strategies like anti consoling so they have different values and preferences. Even it's not only how much effect the intervention has, it's how many factors to really value the preferences. Um, next question, another another question about reason to processing um, to um, the process elements is about. Are the different takeaways able to provide feedback on appeal, or is it just a certain nominated group that can do that? Um, the also previous questions were about the process element of part setting. Next question relates to the outcome element. And, and the question is, we did a lot of process, have we been successful in getting more research topics that are relevant to standards groups or not? Are our next steps after we got the point setting results also increase the likelihood that um, this research topic gets funded 
or um, the people who are very involved become involved in the research. Because one objective of our testing is when you have a research process, you want to get them get easily done, easily get funded, and um, that easily is not a good word. So you you would like them to be quicker be done, quicker be been uh, quicker been funded, and have a high impact. And um, you would another objective of part setting is when you have different stakeholders involved in making decisions, you hope that these people are more interested in the topic and would be involved in the research conducted on this topic. So the next question relates more whether you have achieved this or not. I do do not read for sure all of them because it has it can be very long to read them. And um you see that some of the different questions relate both to the side branches group directly. The research is in the research branches group and the decision makers who make decisions for this group. And finally, is does the results of the pilot's research topics change policies, legislation, practice? It can change policies earlier, but the change in policy is funded. But when the research is already done, is that also changing the clinical practice or health policy afterwards? It's very difficult to access this very ending outcome, but this is the end objective that you're looking for. And um, do we have do we have an appeal feedback mechanism that ensures that these advantage groups are also able to provide feedback? And if this process wasn't successful, it would be highlighted by them. Um, so I would hand away again to Erin to, uh, to conduct a survey about you, but how we can implement this equity lens in your context. Hand, over to you, Erin. Thanks, Mona. So we've looked at priority setting. We've looked at a framework for setting priorities. And Mona's given us some questions that we can be asking about how to bring equity into that priority setting process. So I'd like to think this through a little bit more with everybody on the, uh, who's on the call today. How can we practically implement the equity lens? If we're trying to ensure an equity perspective in our priority setting process, how can we ensure that equity is incorporated throughout? So as a reminder, I'm putting up the slide that Mona's already discussed, showing where equity could be considered in different stages of priority setting. So for example, involving stakeholders or defining criteria and so forth. So I'd like to ask everybody who's on the call today to take a moment and type in any responses or any ideas that you can share about examples or ideas how you can involve the disadvantaged, how you can make sure their needs are being met. And I'll just give a moment for some of those to come through. Uh, Claire's written meeting with them face to face, meeting with the disadvantaged people. Thanks, Claire. Shuching says, using common language and involving people from diversified backgrounds. Mary wonders whether focus groups would be useful. Uh, Leslie says, because it is difficult to involve marginalized, marginalized populations directly, greater involvement of frontline practitioners in research and th synthesis activities can move this forward. Thank you, Leslie. Christina says, partner with consumer groups. Claire suggests that we could translate key documents or key questions for disadvantaged populations. Tracy says that, uh, that she thinks maybe the first thing would be to develop an awareness of who or what are disadvantaged groups that may have an opinion or interest in the area. That's a brilliant point, Tracy. Absolutely. We need to define who these disadvantaged groups are in a particular situation before we even think necessarily about how to involve them or how to, how to conduct the priority setting. Thanks, Tracy. Pam notes uh, that some people may need advocates or proxies. You, you might want to think about uh, user groups and social movements. You could develop a ranking system. Tracy says that uh, perhaps disadvantaged populations think that researchers are a hard to reach community. That's a very different perspective. Thank you, Tracy, that perhaps uh, we're the ones who are hard to reach. Mary said that uh, it, one thing that she's done is uh, we met with a local consumer group to ask their priorities for review outcomes. Very informal, but helpful to the review team. And Sally notes that, that we could go to where people are 
she gives the example, in our pressure ulcer priority setting partnership, we will be doing bedside interviews with people with or at risk of pressure ulcers in residential homes and care settings. And the last comment coming through um, is from Tracy, who says that uh, social networking is a great new media. Thank you so much for those examples, everybody. I really appreciate those different ways that, uh, that we can approach the disadvantaged or have the disadvantaged be involved in what we're doing. So thank you. Sorry, before I get to summary and key messages, I see a couple of comments that have come through with people asking for help from those on the call today. Um, so Linda Smith has said, is anyone aware of examples or tools that show how an equity lens um, can be built for helping with priorities at the executive level? Something that would increase understanding at a broader level, i.e., make it real. So if anybody has a response for Linda, in just a moment, I'm going to type up Linda's email here on the screen. We have Linda Smith at albertahealthservices.ca. You should see that coming up on your screen there. So if anybody has a response for Linda asking about examples or tools that show how an equity lens can be built for helping with setting priorities at the executive level. You'll see Linda's email there on the screen. Thank you. Um, and I also see a, uh, I see a comment from Yannicka who says, approaching disadvantaged groups with suitable methods often puts a label of disadvantaged on them. Avoiding this is challenging. Thank you very much for noting that, Yannicka. I really appreciate that. And Leslie has answered in response to Linda, saying that there are a number of health authorities in Canada that are looking at how to integrate health impact assessment, or HIA tools, particularly those applying an equity lens, within the organization to support effective policy development. And she notes, and Alberta Health Services is one of them. So thank you so much for sharing those comments. And again, you'll see Linda's email there. Um, if you have a response that you could send to her, that would be marvelous and appreciated. Thank you. So to sum up for today's session, we talked about priority setting and emphasized that it can help ensure our questions are met with the right answers. Priority setting is particularly crucial given increasingly limited resources, both financial and time-wise. There are frameworks that can help systematic review authors and review groups to set priorities for review topics and updates. And Mona gave us the example of the Sebald framework, emphasizing that that's, that's a particular framework that we could use to set a priority setting process for reviews and updates. When we're setting priorities, it's important to consider how those priorities will address is issues for the disadvantaged. And finally, the equity lens highlights methods for considering equity in priority setting. So that sums up the session that we've done today, um, the issues that we've discussed, and some of the concerns that Mona and I have raised. We've been answering questions all the way through, um, but if anybody does have any questions, I'll wait a moment for those to come through. In the meantime, I'd like to invite you to return evaluations to us. I'm going to be sending an evaluation through in just a moment to everybody who's on the call today. And if you could take a moment to complete it and return it to us, it would be most appreciated. And these evaluations help us to meet your needs to make sure that what we're talking about is of interest to you, to make sure we're using the right sort of tools, which tools we should use again, which formats to change, et cetera. So that evaluation form is coming through momentarily. And while that comes through, again, I'd like to turn it over to Mona to wrap up for today's session. Mona. Um, thanks a lot, um, Erin. And um, thanks a lot for all your contribution and passion. Um, we are on the journey, and I saw that some, uh, there was a question that the Inquit Lens was implemented or not. And because we just um, finished it, and we are just publishing it in Journal of Clinical Epidemiology along with other articles about part setting and cotton collaboration, we didn't have the chance to operationalize it and implement it. Also, we would be very happy if people would be interested to do that. 
and please join us um, join us on our journey join us on, a, on in the message groups and um, contribute to the discussions we have if you have a community of interest and we have two other webinars this month that you can approach today next week and the week afterwards in February one about updating cognitive views and one about implementation of part setting in cognitive groups and we would have also a workshop on part setting methods which is a very methodological workshop and looking at part setting in any research context um, in June in Plymouth and you are happy to contact me if you want and here are my contact details and um, we would be very happy um, to see you involved in the Ruby groups and um, thanks very much for all of your contributions and um, I hand it over to Erin again thank you very much thank you Mona so that wraps up today's session thank you very much for joining the call today we really appreciate your time and thank you so much for contributing. It was wonderful to have so many different people participate and share their ideas with the group today. So thank you very much. We're going to close today's session. If you could please complete those evaluation forms and return it to us, it would be most appreciated. And if you have any questions, Mona and I will stay on the line just for a few minutes um, to wait for those questions to come through. Otherwise, thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day, and let's send a round of applause to everybody who participated and attended today. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody.